Here you go, 1955, upper left-hand corner, 1955. Um, the general uh, belief is that Australopithecines evolved into like Homo erectus and then evolved into Homo sapiens. That's a general scheme that kind of uh, connects these. But you have the A means Australopithecines, right? So something evolved into Australopithecines, which evolved into Homo erectus, and then Neanderthals and Homo sapiens branched off from there and evolved separately into individual species. <clears throat> 1967, Australopithecines evolved into Homo erectus, that evolved in Neanderthals, that evolved into Homo sapiens. Okay, 1971. Something evolved into the Australopithecines and or Homo habilis now. Australopithecines at this point considered a side group that did not evolve into Homo sapiens, but Homo habilis instead put forth as a leading continuer of who would have evolved into Homo erectus, which evolved into Neanderthals, but Homo sapiens were a separate lineage from both of those. 1980, Australopithecines evolved into Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and this is uh, still kind of where they kind of are citing here. A lot of changing theories through time, but one that was kind of even more, one that's even a little bit more puzzling is this. The difference between the two main views of evolutionary ancestry referred to as the multi-regional theory and the out-of-Africa theory. Okay, multi-regional versus out of Africa. And this kind of works like this. And this isn't the best diagram, but uh, you're going to have to suffer through it, unfortunately. The multi-regional theory works like this. Now, the color-coded, you can see the various areas where Homo erectus has been found. Okay, Africa, Europe, Asia, and even uh, over Oceania, the area there around Australia, the islands of Australia. So the argument is that uh, about a million years ago, Homo erectus first evolved into, in Africa, and then these populations migrated to various regions around the world where we now see Homo erectus. So Australopithecines evolved in Homo erectus in Africa, and then these Homo erectus populations migrated to all these areas where we currently find them, Europe, Asia, etc. And there, in these areas, each of these Homo erectus populations evolved into modern Homo sapiens. Okay, that's been a long-standing view. <clears throat> but recently, this was called the multi-regional theory. Okay, can we find Homo erectus populations in these various areas? And it makes sense that these Homo erectus populations would have kept evolving and would have evolved into modern Homo sapiens. But recently this has been overturned, and now most people have shifted to this, what we call the out of Africa theory, which goes like this. <clears throat> So Australopithecines evolved into Homo erectus in Africa, and then these African Homo erectus populations migrated in these various areas where they can, started to evolve, but then something happened and boom, all of them died off or something. But this population from Africa that kept evolving eventually evolved into Homo sapiens, and then those Homo sapiens migrated and colonized these various areas. Very weird, very weird why these died off, and I don't know, very weird. Marvin Lubinow makes a fairly strong case, can't say how, how uh, solid it is, that a lot of this initial movement towards this view was uh, an attempt by some, of, uh, some uh, evolutionists to kind of throw off the uh, racism that had always been part of the evolutionary theory behind human origins, uh, that these various populations around the globe could be viewed as more or less evolved. And there, ha there had been strong overtones there. I mean, uh, the, the Aborigines in Australia, there have been even people put in muse museums. Uh, there's a famous story of a, a person from Congo who was put in, I believe it was Congo, who was put into a museum. This person even put into a museum for a period of time. They actually hunted the they were hunting the Aborigines, putting them, uh, literally collecting specimens, paid to kill Aborigines and for specimen, museum specimens because they were viewed as uh, less evolved. So and th he makes a case for this. Could be true. You know, there could be some basis for it or not. I not, not, can't really speak to that. But this view, this out of Africa view that Homo sapiens all, that evolved in Africa and migrated to these various regions was bolstered or, or substantiated by mitochondrial Eve studies. I wanted, wanted to find you a magazine cover so you could remember mitochondria. A few, it was big news originally. Uh, now they, oh, uh, genetic studies have revealed that all humans have evolved from one female, and they called that female mitochondrial Eve. And some people, oh, that sounds good, They'd like the Bible and stuff. So I kind of jumped on that. Now, what these studies are, I'm going to come back to this, okay, because there's something kind of interesting here. But uh, 
What, this, what they have found, they've studied the DNA. Mitochondria is one of the little, um, or, what they call an organelle in your cells. So just like you have organs in your body, there are little microscopic organelles in your cells, and one of them is called the mitochondria. Now, most of your DNA is in the nucleus. But there's two organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplast, that have DNA in them. And that's because these are massive chemical factories that need tons and tons of protein. And so they just have all their code right there. So you have mitochondria has its own little DNA. Okay. And the vast majority of the mitochondria you have have come from your mother. That's because the egg cell is really big, the sperm is really small, so there's a lot of mitochondria in the egg, very little mitochondria by comparison. So the vast majority of mitochondria comes from your mother. So what they've did, they do, they've done is they they sequence the mitochondria of various groups, okay. So I sequence the mitochondria of this group, and I I sequence the mitochondria of this group, and found a mutation, a genetic change in this group, and then I sequence the mitochondria of this group over here, and I find the same genetic change and one more, and then from another group over there, I find those two genetic changes, one more. By comparing the muta- these genetic changes, these mutations of mitochondrial DNA of the various living populations, they've come up with this migratory pattern that illustrates that humans have all come from one place and have migrated throughout the world, okay? And this is very much bolstered the whole out of Africa theory. Now, these are not, again, not homo erectus DNA sequences that they're analyzing here, but modern human populations, okay? But there's something very, there's something very interesting there, and I want to come back to it in just a second. So forgive me as I wander off and come back. I want to show you something. There's actually something very cool there. Now, one of the probably the biggest problems with this, all of this, is Marvin Lubinow pointed out in his book, is that uh, we have found modern human fossils along, contemporaneously with, uh, uh, alongside not only Neanderthals, but also Homo erectus and even Australopithecines, almost back to the very beginning. I know you can't see this diagram very well, but these are modern what, timeline of where we find modern Homo sapiens all the way back. You know, close to like, even close to four, three, three and a half, four million years ago. Neanderthals, only a little batch of Neanderthals there. Homo erectus, that's where we find the Homo erectus fossils. Here's Australopithecines. But we have found modern Homo sapien fossils alongside all of these, almost all the way back to the very beginning. And yet, what evolutionists expect is you should only find Australopithecines, you know, and then eventually you should find Homo erectus, and eventually you should find modern Homo sapiens. But we find modern Homo sapiens fossils alongside all of these. You know, seriously challenging this whole view. Lubinow, my own conclusion, he says, as to who these were, who were these Neanderthals, Homo erectus? My conclusion, he says, is that Homo erectus and Neanderthals are actually the same. They're the same. Homo erectus at the lower end with regard to size of a continuum that includes Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and Neanderthals. The range of cranial capacities for fossil humans is in line with the cranial capacities for modern humans. They were just the same. Peter Line argues the same and says that if this is, tr- is, if this is true, then that means there's just an enormous gap. Not just a missing link, but a missing cavern between Australopithecines and, and modern, uh, or, or the genus Homo. He says, without the burden of having to fit fossils into an evolutionary scheme, there's no reason not to accept fossils such as those categorized as Erectus and Neanderthals as belonging to the one humankind. If fossils such as those categorized as Homo erectus and Neanderthals were fully human, then the case for human evolution essentially collapses, and there's an unbridgeable morphological gap between the Australopithecine apes and these humans. Enormous gap. If we're correct on this, Homo erectus and Neanderthals are are just humans, then there's an enormous gap between those and the Australopithecines. They make them look more ape-like. They make the Australopithecines look more human-like as a way of trying to bridge that gap. But when these are finally analyzed and we realize just how human-like these Neanderthals and Homo erectus are, just how ape-like these Australopithecines are, this gap is enormous, is enormous. So who were they? The general view from the Croatian community is that both your Homo erectus and Neanderthals, although you'll see some, uh, some disagreement here, are, these are post-flood humans. These are people that lived after the flood, okay? So, and Peter Line actually gives several possible factors that could have contributed to the differences in their morphology, in their anatomy. Why do they look different? Okay, he gives a few possibilities. He says, perhaps greater genetic diversity and genetic drift within the humankind in the past. True, could be. 
They were living under particularly harsh environmental conditions after the flood, during the ice age, very, very hard times, very, very hard living. Dietary habits very, would be very poor. It would have taken centuries before they could start farming again. Topsoils are decimated by the flood. In, you get your uh, pioneer species come in first, nitrogen fixers in the lot come in first. Eventually, generations after generation, you finally get enough topsoil to where you could actually start growing crop, crops. So nutrient deficiency could play a role, uh, poor, poor dietary habits. I mean, when you're eating nothing but mammoth, you know, for months, you know, kill a big mammoth and you're on mammoth stew and mammoth steaks and mammoth sausage in the morning. Yeah, lots of mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> stress of particular biomechanical forces. Now, what he's referring to here is the fact that humans have historically used uh, things like their teeth for tools. I mean, God's given us a lot of tools, and your teeth are one of those. Without the uh, ad, you know, advantage of having some needle-nose pliers or vice that you can lock some stuff into, use your teeth. So when you're trying to create uh, you know, strands or leather strips or anything, you put that in your mouth, and then you hold that while you like, you know, and that that very act, that, hot, that very act of using your jaw as a tool, as a vice like that, would cause changes. Now, unknown to most people, your skeletal system is constantly remodeling itself. You have cells that are constantly eating away at bone, and then other cells come back and constantly add new bone. Osteoblast or, con or uh, osteoclast are eating away at your bone, and then osteoblasts come back and lay new bone down. And they do this <clears throat> not just during repair, but as a way of rejuvenating your bone and remodeling it based on current needs. Okay, For, so you've had people, you've heard people say, "Oh, I'm not, just, I'm not fat. I'm just big boned." You know, you hear people say this, "I'm just big boned." You know what I mean? Well, this is true in one way. You know, uh, but you're not. But you're big boned because you're big. When you put on more mass, your bones will remodel themselves to help with that additional stress that's being placed upon them. Or people that are involved in some physical activity that requires a lot of real tension on your bone, the bones will be reinforced, will be strengthened. If you ever have a chance, look at someone <clears throat> that, like as a professional rock climber. If you ever see, have a chance to look at a per, someone that's involved in something that's very, very strenuous on bone like that, look, look at their hand. You see all the additional bone development, knuckles on a person that's involved in that kind of stuff. Your bones are constantly remodeling themselves. So possibility. He mentions a pathology. A disease causes a lot of uh, changes, possibly. But I think one of the most compelling is this, longevity. One of the most compelling. Remember that before the flood, people lived to be hundreds of years old, eight, nine hundred years old up until the flood. And then the, the, the lifespan, the longevity of humans fell off gradually after the flood. Now, my, there's, there's, when God says he's going to destroy the world by flood, just before he says, I'm going to destroy the world by flood, he says, man shall not live but to 120 years. I'm going to destroy the world by flood. And it appears to me from that statement that one of the intended consequences of the flood was not just to wipe out the wickedness of the human race that then existed, and, but was to reduce the human lifespan from what it was before, 800 years or so, down to 120, which is the medical max. I did a little search for it and found like a record of one woman who'd said she had lived to 121. Otherwise, 120 is the medical max. You can get there, but barely there. Moses himself died at 120. So it tapered off gradually, okay? And your bones, again, are constantly remodeling themselves, constantly growing throughout your life. So the question is, what would a person look like? Who, who, what would a skeleton of a person look like who was 400 years old? And if that person died alongside someone who's 35 years old, is, could that just be enough of an explanation? You got a modern homo sapien alongside someone that's 400 years old, even though they're brothers or, you know, could be just as simple as that. It's a, it's a, it's a compelling thought. One <clears throat> can't entirely explain it, though, uh, because they have, I can't speak to this with any authority. Authority, okay, but they have found they do find adolescent fossils that they can identify as Neanderthal. The one that I showed you before, the diagram that that uh, Jack Quozo had found was of an adolescent that they had found. They can fi find them and can identify them as Neanderthal, 
And I can't speak with any authority as to whether or not cranial thickness is part of that identification or it's simply the brow ridges. So there's a genetic difference as well. I mean, there's, there is a genetic difference between we, after sequencing the, mitochondria, uh, the uh, Neanderthal genome, there's a genetic, genetic difference. So they were separate populations. Mm, so I can't give you the entire story, okay, but definitely some pieces of it I think we're, we're understanding. And again, if we want to know the true history, what's important, what's critical is that we interpret scientific findings ourselves consistent with the biblical worldview. And that's what we're trying to do. And you look to people that are experts in those fields that are doing this from the biblical worldview as a way of helping, okay? Let me uh, show you one more thing. I told you I was gonna come back to this map. I'm bleeding out, losing a little bit of my color here. Let me see if I can help you with this. Ah, losing some of this. This is not as brown as this should be. Neanderthals are all up in here. This map shows you, it's the same map that I showed you of the mitochondrial Eve study, but overlaid on top of the Homo erectus and Neanderthal ranges, okay? The, all the yellow is where Homo erectus has been found, all the yellow, but this in my, on mine is brown, darker brown right here. So Neanderthals have been found all in this region. Remember, Neander, they haven't found Neanderthals over in Asia, which was kind of puzzling when we found that there had been interbreeding between those groups, okay? So Neanderthals over here, Homo erectus over here, and the red shows you where they have uh, the mitochondrial Eve studies that show the radiation that they believe happened of modern Homo sapiens. So after Homo erectus, evolved in Homo sapiens. But I just want to show you something cool about this diagram. The key point here is this branch right here. Okay? That little branch point right here I think is kind of key on this diagram because I want to show you something. Okay, watch this. This is the location of Mount Ararat where the ark would have landed. Okay? Now I want to show you something else. This is the location, best I could put it on this map, the location of the Tower of Babel right here. Interesting, right? Very interesting that we find a branch point right there. And also what the mitochondrial Eve study indicate was that there are three main mitochondrial Eve lineages. Three main lineages. Noah's sons, three wives. Three main mitochondrial Eve lineages that all branched out from right that point right there. What an interesting parallel with the biblical narrative when properly understood from within that context, Okay. One last March of Progress diagram for you to send you home. Someone sent me this recently. I had to slip it in there. Yeah. All right. All right. So the problem they have is that with this thinking that life is a ladder comes from a lot of the older notions about evolution. And you see old diagrams like this one here, the evolution of horse through time. That's from 1925. It's 90 years old. Okay. It was as good as we had then because we had very few fossil horses. What we now have is a very bushy branching pattern of horse evolution. One that has many, many species which coexist in time. And there's some places, for example, western Nebraska where there are 15 different species of horse in the same hole in the ground. Okay? It's not just a simple linear march through time, one horse to the next. And this is an improvement, right? This is more information over the last 90 years now that we have been able to obtain that shows us how much more complex horse evolution was than we thought 90 years ago. But you'll have creationist books saying, oh, well, they changed their story. Well, of course we did. We got more data. That's what science is supposed to do. <laughs>
You must learn to distinguish between smut and science. Science? Ooh, la di da. There is a scientific fact. Uh -huh. Put your trust in the scientific method. Put your faith in the scientific method. I have enough faith in the scientific method. What, what were you... I mean, was this ever about science? Those damn scientists, they don't know what they're doing. That's bad. Yes. Bad. Bad I can't even hear you. It's just noise coming out of an ugly scientist. The fact that science can account for everything. Science is omnipotent. Science and evidence don't seem to impact much what people believe. And science is supposed to have all the answers. Oh, now, don't speak to me of antiquated notions like a soul. I mean, you, you, you're a scientist. Can you measure a soul? Can you measure it? Huh? Science is full of coincidences. Man, I freaking love science. Ha! <laughs>